and it was established by the EU that uh, everything that Saakashvili had said was fake. Yes, all, all our media was just repeating whatever uh, came from Saakashvili. But after the war, it was revealed through this fact-finding mission that, you know, it wasn't true. The, that uh, Saakashvili began the war by bombing uh, South Ossetia indiscriminately and also killing Russian peacekeepers. Now, uh, so so th this has kind of been established as a fact, but we see that the narrative is immune to facts. Whenever it pops up in a newspaper now, no, no, Russia started it and uh, it was unprovoked and, uh, and, and this is it. And you can't resist the narrative because once you challenge it, well, then you're taking Russia's side against ours. So... Now, again, uh, so you have to choose between us or them. So it's very powerful. Uh, it's very powerful uh, in terms of um, appealing to this very basic instinct in human nature that they, either you're with us or with them, uh, because people will censor themselves, they will censor others, and uh, they will become also quite radical. So it's a, it's a powerful instrument. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I got two colleagues with me to kick off a little series on this channel about the upcoming parliamentary elections in Georgia, slated for October 26th. I'll be co-hosting this talk with Lasha Kasratze, who's himself Georgian, but working as an international relations analyst in the US. Our guest today is Dr. Glenn Deason, a professor at the University of Southeast Norway and an associate editor at the journal Russia and Global Affairs. I'm sure many of you know him from his brilliant episodes on the Duran and other YouTube channels. Glenn also has his own channel if you want to follow him there. Gentlemen, welcome. Well, thank, thank you, Pascal. Pascal. Good, to be back. Back. Good to be with you. Nice to well, meet you, Glenn. Thank you for having you both online, because we really need to discuss Georgia. Um, I've said it before, and I'm saying it again, the neocons are still not done with Georgia. In a previous program about a year ago with Lasha, um, I, we called Georgia the one that got away, right, after the 2008 short war. Uh, Georgia moved, especially after 2012, when the Saakashvili government lost power, moved away from um, outright confrontation, although confrontation, I mean, it was Russia that invaded then in 2008 after the uh, the, the provocations that came from uh, Georgia, and Georgia still has two of its regions uh, occupied by Russia. But the horrible thing is that moment, at the moment, the media in the West portrays Georgia, the, the current Georgian government, the Georgian green, dream government that is um, that is uh, trying to somehow balance between this uh, rock and the hard place, portraying that as being pro-Russian, which is kind of very strange to me. But let's maybe start with uh, with you, Glenn. Um, how do you interpret how? currently the narrative about Georgia is being constructed, especially in this run-up towards the election in uh, one and a half months' time? Well, it's uh, I guess it's worth looking towards the, uh, what was previously done, both in uh, Georgia's Rose Revolution of 2003, as well as the Orange Revolution that in Ukraine in 2004. Now, in, in these instances, we saw there was uh, a lot of... Uh, um, well, there were legitimate protests. The people have legitimate concerns, and uh, and uh, a lot of this were effectively hijacked uh, in order for the uh, for the United States to push uh, what is now referred to as color revolutions, in which it effectively became a platform for pushing a pro-American, anti-Russian position. Now, I see a lot of the same trends now. That is, if you go through the media. It's all these arguments that, uh, well, the Georgians, many are having some uh, yeah, difficult times. Uh, there's environmental concerns. There are um, there are uh, yeah, economic problems. Uh, some are not happy with the government policies. Uh, all of these are legitimate concerns. But then what, what is the solution? Well, uh, you know, you have uh, many, many people in Georgia feel the country is going the wrong way. You know, we have these problems in the West as well. Well, uh, what is the solution? Well, you can either be pro-European and follow your European dream or be slaves to the Russians. Uh, and this is effectively the, 
the dilemma. And under this, uh, all, all of these problems becomes effectively, uh, well, it lends legitimacy for interfering into the election uh, of of Georgia. The problem here is not that uh, there's not a reasonable uh, opposition to the uh, to the government in Georgia. It's just it's quite obvious that as the West and uh, Russia wrestles over which side Georgia should be on in this new dividing lines in Europe, uh, this is not the first priority. <laughs> all this arguments uh, of liberal democracy, uh, human rights are being used in order to uh, push for uh, yeah, interference into Georgia and effectively make it into a pro-NATO, anti-Russian mm-hmm. actor. And uh, this is what the former prime minister, as well as the current prime minister of Georgia, has said, that they fear the Americans are trying to pursue regime change in Georgia for the purpose of uh, opening a second front against Russia. So this is... Uh, this is a, a a reasonable or in the real concern, but we don't address this. We we just say, well, you know, they are just being puppets of Putin and uh, the protesters. They're the real, you know, they're the real Georgia. The government is effectively not legitimate, as they're rejecting Europe and yeah, being puppets of uh, the Russians. Lasha, you've been to Georgia just a couple of weeks ago, and you spend a considerable amount of time there talking to various actors. Um, uh, what is the mood on the ground at the moment and how do you think that this Western framing of what Georgian elections are all about um, influences now local perceptions? Thank you, Pascal. Well, first of all, let me just say uh, what we are doing here right now is extremely important. Uh, Georgia has gotten uh, the short end of the stick um, ever since it's um independence from the Soviet Union after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, And it's been caught up in this morass of propaganda narratives, um, false hopes. uh, uh, And what we're doing here right now, I think it's it's very much needed. Uh, Unfortunately, you know, I was just told by a colleague a couple of days ago that there's plenty being written about Georgia, but you don't hear as much about it. And it's always under the radar. and yet Georgia has always been um, at the receiving end, right from the get-go. I think it's one of the first countries uh, of this Western um, uh, narratives of it joining, of becoming a future candidate for NATO and the European Union and is the shining beacon uh, in the region for uh, for you know countries to follow, uh, you know, as, an, as, a, as a shining example as to what it what it means to have reforms and what it means to be a member of the West. But unfortunately, um, none of that materialized. Um, and the reality remains to be harsh and ugly. Um, so, but um, to answer your question more concretely, my visit in Tbilisi, uh, and I've spoken to a bunch of people there, um, um, the the way that I can describe it is, um, there is stability and there is this collective notion that basically people want to be left alone. Uh, yes, there is this underlining sort of um, um, worry, anxiety as to where the country is headed. Uh, but at the same time, um, I've seen that uh, Georgians are not concerned. They're, they know Russia very well. Georgian collective psyche, its history, understands Russia perfectly well. The question they're asking is, what is it that America is doing? What is it that Europe is doing? And why is it that after 30 years, basically, there has not been uh, the industrialization, successful industrialization policy in Georgia? Why is poverty still rampant? Um, And on the geopolitical front, why is it that, you know, Georgia's separatist regions are still separate, Abkhazia, South Ossetia. And what is the eventual, the question is, where is Georgia headed? And eventually, when will this end? And when will Georgia become a sovereign state, fully sovereign state? Um, and there is a, there always been, Georgia has always been a country of paradoxes. Um, on the one hand, yes, people complain about uh, you know, economic problems. And there, there is plenty. I will be the first one to say it. I've always said it on your show, Pascal. 
Uh, and of course, there is, you know, uh, corruption has always been part of Georgia and the Soviet Union, Soviet system. And then in the post-Soviet Georgia, it was even, you know, it went into the extreme version of it um, after, in the early 90s. Uh, but, you know, if I'm going to sit here and say that, um, um, you know, corruption is sort of destroying the society or the country or, uh, you know, it is or if, if the country is on the edge of another you know, civil war, it is because of corruption, I'd be lying to you. I don't think that is the electoral issue. Now, in a normal circumstance, yes, you know, people will come out and say, I want my economy back. You know, I want I want I want salaries to be raised. I want, you know, uh, 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 you know, professional, you know, you know, future generations to to be in the government. Um, uh, you know, I want accountability. Um, but in Georgia, again, there hasn't been time for these issues to be revealed and to be sort of brought forth to the to the um, um, top five issues, even of what bothers the society, what disturbs the society. It's always been the discussion of: Are we joining the West? Are you pro-Russian or are you pro-Western? Uh, and even any any speak of pragmatism towards Russia, just for the sake of survival as a state, uh, will land you in the camp of being a pro-Russian. So this is the extent of radicalization. I mean, the, the thinking in, in terms of the objective way of thinking about the reality and about the neighborhood of Georgia, the geopolitics, and both geopolitically speaking and internally in terms of domestic politics, has gone out the window because the the separation between objective analysis, social analysis, and reality, and how to accept that reality, how to look at that reality, um, the gap is enormous. There is a huge vacuum in, within this social and public discourse that could analyze these issues and weigh in and gauge as to where Georgia is headed, which is the right, if you ask me, and I'm sure you guys agree with me, this is the right of any free society to be able to discuss these issues. But um, this has not been the case. And so my long, my long answer to your question, Pascal, is even within this reality, even within this reality, the society is sort of moving along. That's the that's the sense that I've gotten. And people are just sick and tired of, um, you know, are you pro-Russian? Are you pro, uh, pro-Western pro sort of dichotomy? Uh, and they're just moving along as long as there is some sense of stability, as long more or less people have work and the way they can, you know, and, 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 the, and the source to support their families. They're just moving. I was very shocked six, seven years ago when I was there. That was not the case. Um, so, and also some of my colleagues told me that even in this, um, uh, very unpopular ish social economic issue in Georgia, agriculture, even there, there have been, uh, you know, dramatic improvements. Uh, so I think overall it could be much, much worse. Um, so, you know, and, you know, and of course, I mean, it could be much worse. It could be war. The one thing is right yeah. now, um, Georgia still has a territorial conflict with Russia, but the guns are silent. And uh, the, Glenn, you're the one who, who observes also these narratives that have been built up for, for a long time. And right now, again, we're in a moment when in Politico, in the Washington Post, any kind of newspaper of like Western newspaper you open, it always creates this di dichotomy, pro-Russian or pro-Western. Um, and, and this is heating up despite the fact that the current government, the Georgia Dream government, has no diplomatic relations with Russia. This is not a Russia-friendly government. Um, how can you make sense of this, Glenn, that this this onslaught from the outside, especially from the West, is is always about creating this dichotomy between evil Russia, good, good Europe, and then uh, Georgia being captured by like oligarchic forces that want to want to take it toward Russia. Why is it always the same stupid narrative that creeps up? Well, I think we put the systemic incentives in place for that uh, already back in the 1990s, and uh, indeed that was always uh, part of my key criticism of uh, of uh, expanding NATO that this would. Uh, effectively revive the block politics logic of the Cold War. At least, uh, as I pointed out during the Cold War, we were fighting over influence in the Third World because the, 
dividing lines in Europe were clearly delineated. This time around, when we began to expand NATO uh, towards Russian borders, the, the the logic is always you have to be either with us or with the Russians, and uh, and uh, and uh, this becomes very problematic in countries from such as Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine, especially because. Not only are they in the border region and the shared neighborhood, if you will, uh, but the societies are also deeply divided. And uh, uh, so you see this for, this pressure to choose between uh, West or East that is uh, can exacerbate some of those divisions. And, you know, even if a majority would like to or prefer, for example, joining the EU, the EU comes with NATO, obviously, and uh, and uh, you know one shouldn't be dismissive of a uh, of a country like uh, Georgia. If you if you're a small country uh, next on the border next to a giant, most likely you're going to have some historical grievances in which your large neighbor have uh, violated your sovereignty. It's also true if you look in uh, Central America, Latin America with the United States. But when the solution becomes to invite another rival great power, such as the U.S. on the Russian border. One also has to ask, what is the motivations? Uh, what are the in interests of that other great power? Uh, we always, the media always have to frame it when it's either us, you know, the European dream versus uh, Russian slavery. Uh, it, it's always this good versus evil. And it's all, always implied that our interests in the West or NATO is merely to deliver freedom and opportunities and uh, uh, very selfless uh, but as we saw in Ukraine, and I think also in Georgia, the interests are quite different. You, you see an, an, an instrument, a dagger, which you can point towards uh, Russia. And this is why uh, when the prime minister of uh, Georgia warns that the Americans are looking to uh, to topple the government, to use the Georgians uh, as an instrument against the Russians, this is uh, quite uh, reasonable and a uh, and, uh, a, a, a normal concern but uh, overall this you know good versus evil this is also the foundation of, of propaganda as long as you can make people buy into the uh, logic that this is simply good versus evil or the placeholder uh, the liberal democracy versus the vile authoritarianism then um, all facts kind of disappear into the background and none, none of what each side does really matters anymore i mean they can have uh, hardly any diplomatic ties with Russia at all, but they're still puppets of Putin because they're not bending to uh, the need to America. Meanwhile, the United States, they can interfere in any ways they want into the, not just the US, the EU as well, into Georgian civil society, but it's not interference. They're just there to promote democracy and assist the civil society. So facts no no longer matter as long as you can make people buy into these uh, stereotypes which we're selling and uh, i think this is the main the main problem just as a quick side note you know during the rose revolution of 2003 um the, this was also labeled then a democratic revolution now lasha will probably know better but uh, if i'm not mistaken sakashvili ran pretty much unopposed he won more than 96 percent of the votes i think and also right. once he was in power what did the eu do and the united states they ignored the georgian opposition's warning that uh, they were uh, that, they, that they were severing ties with russia they ignored all the human rights abuses uh, they ignored Saakashvili's crackdown on the political opposition. So this is not our we, we, this is not our values. Like it's always popular to present the conflict as Russian, you know, belligerent uh, interest versus our good values. But uh, we we tend to use these good values merely as an ins instrument to conceal our 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 interests. Because if you have competing interests and you can launder that as good values versus bad values. That's pretty much the definition of propaganda, and I think that's what we're doing in uh, Georgia as well, and uh, not to the interest of the Georgians, I would add. Absolutely. Uh, Pascal, did you want to add something? or Yeah, I can just respond. No, absolutely. Uh, I, I agree with you, Glenn. This is actually, speaking of Saakashvili, um, that whole narrative about um, where the information stopped, right, uh, coming out of Saakashvili's regime, um, my colleagues, actually here in the States and also obviously in Georgia, uh, who are fundamental and opposite ends, that confirmed this very common fact that every time there would be a, a, a um, um, 
a report of some sort or complaint from Tbilisi, uh, opposition uh, during Saakashvili's government, uh, that there were some egregious violations of human rights taking place, or you know, confiscation, illegal confiscations of businesses, or what have you. Um, the 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 U.S. version uh, that I've gotten is that you know it would reach the State Department, and then from the State, you know, it would stay in the State Department. That information because George W. Bush. Uh, loved his golden boy Saakashvili and he hated Putin and so he didn't want to know any violations, any uh, you know abuses of power that were taking place in Tbilisi um, as a way for him to just you know solely focus on Georgia as the beacon of liberty in the region um, and, and basically an instrument against Russia and this information has been corroborated basically in Tbilisi too by my, by my close colleagues, um, uh, you know, saying that um, uh, during meetings when Zagashvili was just fresh into, the, in her, into his uh, presidency, um, everyone sort of understood the personality of him, uh, the way he was. Um, and, um, you know, folks in Washington, diplomats, uh, all the way up to the president, um, George W. Bush, they just purposefully just ignored it. Um, ignored what was happening. Uh, and so the main focus was, look, the, we are, basically it was the neocon, uh, you know, you know, strategy um, uh, to maintain uh, this unfettered support for Saakashvili as this young reformist, Western educated leader in the middle of the South Caucasus. Uh, this to them was something unprecedented. To a certain extent, it was. Some of the some of the reforms that Saakashvili implemented were unprecedented in the region. Uh, but what happened afterwards was just entirely covered up and ignored. Um, uh, all because Washington's really hatred of Moscow and, and Putin. Um, and that approach we know now um, had no future. There was nothing that the United States could do vis-a-vis -vis Georgia uh, to do something against Russia. It was always well, if let's just use Georgia, but you know, if Russia collapses, uh, quote unquote, great. If not, you know, Russia might come back and chop off another twenty percent from Georgia. Well, we can always call them, you know, freedom-loving folk uh, and brave people who are fighting against evil Russia. Um, it was basically on that superficial level that was po that policy was being made. One of the adults in the room in Washington, in my opinion, was always uh, Bob Gates, if you recall. Um, uh, he was the defense minister um, uh, uh, under Obama and under Bush, and um, I have you know enormous respect for uh, for him. Um, and he was always warning uh, that this was going to be. We were, they were playing with fire and that Russia was going to come in at some point and um, um, reinvade Georgia uh, because of this uh, aggressive uh, sort of policy out of Washington. Um, uh, and then I'm not even going to mention Victoria Newlands and Condi Rice's of the world because we all know what, what that philosophy entails. Um, uh, but... Um, um, you know, in terms of in terms of creating these narratives, um, uh, it is becoming much clearer now. The country is really waking up, uh, realizing that it was nothing but hoax. Um, no security guarantees, no economic development. Um, you know, uh, these two separatist regions remain to be separatist, supported by Russia, um, and basically, it is this government um, uh, that deserves credit in terms of resisting and standing up um you know to this you know fake narratives that was destroying georgia literally um and they really prevented yet another 2008 invasion of russia uh because they realized that america was nowhere to be found it was just talk and you know georgia had to really reapply and go back to its original principles of geo regional geopolitics to really survive and then sort of rekindle, refi you know, find again, um, you know, relations with Russia. Um, and here is the paradox and irony of this all. It all goes back to Russia at the end of the day. Georgia has just been, you know, is, is a victim of false promises, basically. And as much as Georgians want to become members of the West, you know, geopolitics always rears its ugly head 
And it says, look, it is the, if there is any future for Georgia's sovereignty to be re, um, uh, you know, re reenacted again, we have to go through Russia and the Kremlin. We got to talk to regional neighbors. Um, and by the way, I just want to add something. Um, th these these ideas of, of geo regional geopolitics in Georgia um, are being popular. Well, popularized is the wrong word, but they're being um, discussed in academia. And uh, Zurab Honelidze, who is the uh, rector of the Sukhumi State University, uh, and he's a close colleague of mine, uh, his book, Georgian Paradigm of Peace, actually, if I may just say that on the show, um, uh, proposes a very pragmatic concept on, 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 on how the South Caucasus region as a geopolitical space should develop. Um, and it is shocking and tragic that such concepts, such academic sort of analysis have been purposefully marginalized in Georgia. Um, and it's always been, uh, you know, this, this hammering of these, you know, neocon, neoliberal, uh, 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 you know, concepts and views um, that really almost made people believe that there are no alternatives but those to think, to think of. The question, the question to me is also like, Glenn, do you think that the strategists in Washington, in Brussels, actually really also think that there is only only with us or against us? Or at the end of the day, do they have a more nuanced uh, approach, actually, of, of how these spheres of influence, which are back, um, work? Because the Caucasus are are not, not a clear cut issue, right? Who Who's with whom? Um, even if you go down all the way to Turkey, there's a lot of ambivalence about being being a NATO member, but applying for BRICS, you know. Is this maybe the new kind of in-between zone that we, that we are seeing emerging? Yeah, and I think ignoring that in-between zone is quite important. And that's kind of a common theme of what both you and Lasha has been arguing this either us or them, either with NATO or with the Russians. Uh, so are you, pro, um, are you going with uh, the Americans or going with the Russians? There's always the main two options, but uh, but this is very limiting. And it's also good for uh, pushing an agenda because if if you if you argue that, you know, it's not, for example, in Georgia's interest to pursue more aggressive policies towards its much larger neighbor, well, then, you're, then you're, if you're not going towards NATO, that means you're going towards Russia. That's the only option. But this is the fallacy. It's not just this dual option. And uh, um, But I think this is the, the interest of um, of uh, this neocons in the United States to present it as such, that it's either this or the other. Because the only thing they have to do then is uh, suggest that uh, uh, being pro-Russian is worse than being pro-NATO. But uh, this... But as as you also argue, this is not a, this is not about being pro-Russian or not. But I also, you know, I I took to Twitter during uh, some of these protests, and and I noticed the same response because I was just uh, very shocked by how easily the it was to to win over the West because uh, uh, you know over there they had this um, uh, loss in terms of uh, uh, putting some limitations or transparency on all these NGOs. Again, it shouldn't be very controversial. Uh, yet it was, but uh, what, what I reacted to was the only thing they had to do is show pictures on the media. You know, there's these people protesting. Uh, you know, they would, they don't like these laws, and then here's the government. Oh, they're all put in puppets, and that's it. The whole the the the, me, the the public was won over. Okay, well now it's reasonable to topple the government, isn't it? Uh, we can, uh, you know, this. Uh, uh, well, what about the law which they were pushing through? Sure, uh, well, what should we think about this? Well, people can't stay informed on everything, so you do the same thing, the dichotomy. Well, it's a, it's a Russian law because they want to limit uh, NGOs' uh, power. So, and NGOs are important because they represent civil society. I mean, it's it's an absurd simplification. NGOs are, uh, first of all, they they can give a, uh, they they can allow a small minority to outweigh a, a silent majority, NGOs and civils. The idea that the NGOs should have some monopoly on civil society is, uh, is is a bit extreme. But furthermore, when these NGOs are financed only by foreign governments, it becomes even more so. And this is why it's all, also this us versus them logic where this falls apart, because the whole argument is, uh, well, um, Georgia wants to restrict this, but uh, you know, under the assumption that is foreign intervention, as if it's some crazy conspiracy. 
as if obviously if these organizations are all financed by Western governments, uh, which surely we don't have any interest beyond, uh, you know, some altruistic ideas about spreading democracy. But as we keep seeing over and over again, it's uh, um, it's uh, the, the main objective will always be to make sure that uh, Georgia f- falls into the Western orbit. Not membership necessarily, but a bit like Ukraine. Just uh, we didn't want it Ukraine into in EU either. We just didn't want it in the Russian orbit. So it has to choose us or them. So it's a bit like Turkey and the EU, by the way. We would love for them to, you know, jump through hoop after hoop, but uh, uh, they're not actually going to get inside. That, that's quite obvious. But um, I don't know. I got off the point, but my <laughs> my 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 point is this: us versus them. It's 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 really how all the rhetoric is organized, and also how any dissent uh, can be not just shamed but also criminalized. The interesting thing is that these that these narratives manage to remain and and remain popular, especially in the West, even when they are utterly, completely, a hundred percent disproven. Right of the the, the, the like even just this idea that this refer- this uh, new law ngo law is pro russian is so easy easy to disprove and there is there are now so many of these narratives that have already collapsed or that changed you know with ukraine it was so interesting that for 8 9 10 years it was fine to talk about um the right re- wing uh well <laughs> neo nazi wing of like the Azov and so on, and there were many, many articles about this, and then all of them disappeared, or they were not talked about anymore, and it became a a, a um, capital sin to talk about the ultra right wing in those terms. And you, we know the influence of Victoria Nuland in Ukraine. We, she gave an interview the the other day also about the involvement in in sinking the twenty twenty two Istanbul uh, accords. Um, that 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 never became a thing but these the narrative they they stay in place we the next person we're going to have on this show is going to be Ivan Khatkhanovsky who who's a Ukrainian and researched the Maidan massacre we now know that these Maidan massacres and the people who were killed were killed from the site that was under the the actual control of the pro maidanists and that this was an instigated uh, uh, um affair all of this is clear now, but the narrative remains. The question then to me is um, inside, the inside groups are here what matters very much, right? For Georgia, uh, Lasha, how much of this Western good versus evil, uh, um, Europe versus Russia, how much of that is being believed inside of Georgia of the narrative? And how much is is is, is just something that, that, that the West would like to impose as should be believed. Well, uh, excellent point. I mean, uh, it's been believed to the extent that it tore the society apart. Uh, that's sort of the point I'm trying to you know, convey to my colleagues here in the States that, you know, this, these narratives have really become, has produced a new generation of extremists, really. Uh, you, you know, with, and I hate to say this about the young generation. Young generation is basically the future of any society, any country. But there is a segment uh, of, of, you know, and especially in a small country like Georgia with 3.74 million people, you know, you need a healthy, uh, a new generation that has healthy, objective, um, um, you know, ability to, ability, you know, to critically assess the reality around them, right? Uh, sort of cognitive capacity to do that. And what we see and what I've seen is there is a faction within these young Georgians that are just extremists, really. They're very much radicalized, and it's a shame. Uh, and and so I think sort of the cause of that is, um, you know, the the promotion of these narratives, promotion of, of, you know, you're either with us or against us, this my way or highway type of mentality. Um, and... The great irony is that most of these kids do not even know the West. You know, some of them have lived in the West. They speak some English, whatever. But uh, what I'm saying is they're not experienced in Western. They don't understand the West. Uh, You know, they haven't lived there for a long amount of time. Um, They don't know much about its history, its politics, its economics, its foreign policy. Um, And they're just being sort of fed 
um, you know, these these narratives that are really poisoning the um, social discourse. It's almost impossible to speak to a certain segment of that population. Uh, they're so radicalized. Um, and that and then that aspect of, of it sort of widens into the into the larger uh, society uh, and has a very negative impact on on the overall public opinion. But again, to my surprise, I've noticed folks who are not just Western educated, but have worked in the West, have had great careers in the West and who have retired now uh, in Georgia. Uh, and, you know, who basically what I'm saying here is that to love living in the West, we, you know, I love living in the United States. I love, you know, and, and so some of the Georgians who have lived in the States for a long, long time, we appreciate the West sort of positive side of it. Those are the people who are actually telling me that they're very much pleased with the way Georgian politics and the Georgian state, the government has been handling what's what's happening, considering what's happening and the considering sort of this political wave after wave that is uh, being, uh, that they face uh, from, from, from the West and from Washington really. Um, and so it could be worse, they say, uh, but, uh, you know, they will take things as they are today. Um, mm. And even even if I can just personally once again say that, I mean, six, seven years ago and compared to today is a night and day difference. I was I was shocked. I was very much surprised that there is stability and there is sense of sort of collective um, of, of desire to be sort of to be left alone and and desire to be with to live within the stable sort of quiet society. People, I think, in my opinion, are just tired of this constant radicalization, uh, although it's still there. Um, so, but that's that's the that's the impression I've gotten. Um, I do have several questions for Glenn, and then maybe we can get to those eventually. Yeah, um, I, I, I just else? need to, I need, I need to ask you one thing, Glenn, and then I'll, sure. I'll give you the mic. Glenn, do you think the the game is this one. Do you think the game is to sell the narrative to the local Georgian population, or do you think in the end the game's a different one? Um, another Maidan, another uh, uh, working through these NGOs. What do you think is currently going on as we are building towards this election in October? Well, it's obviously many, uh, to influence uh, the Georgians on the ground, but it's also to. Uh, well, mobilize uh, public opinion in the West for any support for any interference. And uh, yeah, I just want to say as well, one of the dangerous, uh, um, because Lasha keeps talking about the radicalization, and this is also one of the problems because in any society you need to have a common ground. But uh, when everything is either West or Russia, uh, the, the, common, uh, the, the common ground kind of disappears. It's uh, There's nowhere to meet anymore. And this is why it's very dangerous when you do not have any third options, such as uh, uh, yes, <laughs> which which is usually rooted in in common sense. Uh, so yeah, also as as you were speaking before, Pascal, I just thought I thought of um, when you mentioned that narratives. How can this narrative continue to exist? And I, I thought about the the narrative of the war, by the way, because uh, before we talked today, I sent this article by from Washington Post, and which. Uh, it, it was criticizing the government because they had accused uh, you know former prime minister Saakashvili of provoking this uh, in Russia's invasion in 2008 and they just the Washington Post just criticized it at least the writer there that this is absurd that uh, you know this was the Russians fault but uh, this is fascinating because uh, if you remember back in 2008 the the, the EU they they did uh, uh, launch this independent international fact finding mission by uh, the diplomat Heidi uh, Tagli, uh, yeah, and uh, it was established, Hawaiian. and it was established by the EU that uh, everything that Saakashvili had said was fake. Yes, all, all our media was just repeating whatever uh, came from Saakashvili, but after the war, it was revealed through this fact-finding mission that you know it wasn't true. The, that uh, Saakashvili began the war by bombing uh, South Ossetia indiscriminately and also killing Russian peacekeepers. Now, uh, so so the. This has kind of been established as a fact, but we see that the narrative is immune to facts. Whenever it pops up in the newspaper now, no, no, Russia started it and uh, it was unprovoked and, uh, and and this is it. And you can't resist the narrative because once you challenge it, well, then you're taking Russia's side against ours. So 
Now, again, uh, so you have to choose between us or them. So it's very powerful. Uh, it's very powerful uh, in terms of um, appealing to this very basic instinct in human nature that the, either you're with us or with them, uh, because people will censor themselves, they will censor others, and uh, they will become also quite radical. So it's a, it's a powerful instrument. Lasha, your question. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm with you on that, Glenn. Uh, you know, uh, I think the utmost effort has been made to um, really blur those lines, to just basically marginalize, uh, you know, objectivity and um, really the capacity of the population to think on its own. It just that's that's the great enemy, in my opinion. Um, um, so I think when we, we mentioned Ukraine, obviously, how can we not mention Ukraine? Uh, you know, uh, with these discussions, uh, one of the things is that, um, um, in my opinion, I think what's happening in uh, the sort of causalities of what's happening in Ukraine and what has happened in Georgia are basically identical. It's the same. Uh, it's just with Ukraine, the tragedy is on a grand scale and it's unfolding and you know as we speak. Um, in Georgia, it was over in five days. But I think philosophy behind it, the sort of causes of what happened on the Georgian scale and respectively, right, for these countries, I think that that philosophy um, um, is basically the same. Uh, and yet you don't hear much about Georgia, but you hear about Ukraine, right? You know, rightfully so, I understand. But at the same time, um, you know, I, I just wish that Georgia also came up as a, in, in, the, in the Western media or in, 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 in uh, alternative media space like this, which, by the way, is the only space left to speak the truth nowadays, unfortunately, um, uh, as a yet another sort of a variable, uh, important variable that, of the country that actually was the first one to, to saw uh, uh, and to experience the in real time the danger of what was uh, uh, what was being concocted uh, and the risks of what was being said, um, uh, you know, between the 2003 and 2012. Um, with that, I just wanted to ask uh, a few questions. Some of them are on regional geopolitics and where Georgia is headed. For example, uh, one of the one of the points that I'll be making is, <clears throat> you know, everybody talks about how um, these elections will be. Um, very risky, um, uh, and a bunch of people are sort of, you know, waiting from from the you know from behind the scenes uh, to cause yet another political turmoil, uh, and for that to be avoided, basically, the Georgian Dream has to win um, uh, with with large numbers. That gap has to be um, quite noticeable because if it's a close call, then. Um, uh, the West, you know, with their uh, NGO partners will blur the lines even more. And within that chaos will result yet another, um, you know, revolution. Uh, to what extent do you think that is realistic? Because my point has always been, we have Russia now that is 10 times more powerful. Um, we have Russia now that uh, has learned its lesson. Um, um, do you think uh, that ignoring that major variable is a smart way to look to analyze this, this thesis, if you will? Um, and, and do you think that it's just going to be that, which is, you know, if the West doesn't like the elections, doesn't recognize these elections, they will just cause another color revolution and everything will go back to 2003? Um, or do you think Russia will act? Um and how will Washington eventually will handle it? I mean, this is this this is these are the questions that I'm sort of interested in, and I want to know your your take on that. Well, it's uncertain how Russia would would react. I think uh, I, I can't imagine it would intervene uh, mi militarily, not at least not at this point in time, given that it's already bogged down. This is one of the actually reliefs in the West now, as long as the war in uh, going mm -hmm. on in Ukraine, it will uh, limit uh, Russia's, uh, you know, flexibility in other areas. But if there's a, but uh, I think it would be an interest, anyways, uh, at least from the United States or, or many of his partners, if uh, if if there would be another color revolution, even if it wouldn't result in a war, if at least it would uh, increase the tensions between uh, between Georgia and Russia. And this is the thing; it's often it can be in the 
interest to have conflicts. This was kind of the lesson of the 1870 Prussian Franco war. If you can, mm -hmm. if you can, uh, well, e either provoke or take advantage of any conflicts, then it shapes the, the identity formation of us versus them. This is what, you know, assisted in, uh, bringing uh, unifying Germany in 1871 simply because if you fight against a common enemy so this is uh, so if you can have a, a little bit of more of conflict between Georgia and and uh, Russia that would further cement uh, Georgia's uh, role into into the hands of uh, of NATO that being said um, I guess uh, Georgia remembers also 2008 when uh, they they did have this conflict with uh, Russia and uh, the West didn't uh, intervene because many had hoped they would uh, stop the Russians, especially at the tunnels and all, but uh, it, it never happened. And I think that goes also a bit back. Of course, we can draw these links between Georgia and Ukraine, but I think Ukraine is a, is a more appealing proxy because, as you said, Georgia is less than 4 million, Ukraine almost 40. It's a much more powerful fighting force, which you can bleed russia for a much longer period of time and yeah, keep in the game so um but uh, no I, I i'm not really sure how how the the the, the, the russian would respond but uh, it all depends how how it plays out uh, i i it just seems very strange if, if the russians would use military force that's that's all i'm saying and even, even right. in ukraine with with the with the coup in 2014 they uh, one of the things they were able to pull out when they safeguarded their Black Sea fleet was exactly, you know, they were able to pull this off without any bloodshed. I think that's how they'd hoped it would play out at least. But, uh, yeah. I think in the worst case scenario, uh, just to um, just to imagine um, sort of the extreme escalation of this. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree that uh, Russia might not, you know, repeat the military intervention because it's just not might not be worth smart strategy for them. But uh, I think, do you think there will be an effort to save the current government in Tbilisi? Um, you know, sort of soft interference, if you will, um, and not to turn the South Caucasus into yet another rump region. Um, you know, similar to that of what's happening uh, in Ukraine, because uh, again, Russia doesn't want you know this type of a conflict on several fronts uh, it's you know like you said it, it's focusing on ukraine um but um uh, you know I, I i doubt i mean i don't think that russia will do nothing um in terms you know if it sees that there is a realistic possibility of of um uh you know um overthrowing this government um and to what extent do you think it will be some sort of a soft intervention to save this government? Uh, and in that case, uh, if that happens, then what are, what will be the options for the West, really? I mean, uh, you know, if 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 you know, ironically speaking, like Georgia will 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 um, come under the fold of Russia if 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 the West keeps pushing Georgia. That's that's how that's how. I have this envision. The more you push Georgia, the closer you draw them to Russia. You bring them to Russia, and then if Russia uses that, um, especially you know, uh, to a few weeks and days leading up to elections, and then post-election, um, shortly after the after the elections, um, there is a good chance, in my opinion, that Russia's sort of soft power uh, behind the scenes will intervene to uh, to save the current Georgian dream government. Uh, is that a too extreme of a big scenario, you think? Uh, because, again, if, if, if the current government collapses as a result of these fake accusations of, you know, faking elections and they have to step down, but, you know, how, you know, we know those phrases, you know, right. Ivanishvili must go. I can just hear it, right? Um, uh, if that starts to happen, um, what will be the options for the West and Moscow? Well, uh, when I was dismissive of Russian uh, interference, I, I, I was yeah. yeah referring to the the military aspect. I yeah, I, I would almost take it for granted that if the it looks like uh, that uh, the the, the, ex, uh, the current government might be toppled, uh, I think definitely they would uh, uh, do what they can to uh, to keep it in power. But right. uh, so so I I don't see any moral. <laughs> uh objections for you know for for them uh i mean for for them like moral would prevent them from doing so i think that of course they would this is this would fall under a category of a 
of a huge threat if uh, Georgia becomes a U.S. outpost. So the, the, but my 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 point is the more overt such interference is, it can be often be counterproductive, and that's what uh, I think. Um, uh, if 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 the West is not successful, I think then or the U.S. Uh, wouldn't be able to swing the election its way. Uh, I, I think. The failed, the failed effort could uh, could prove to be counterproductive. So then, in Russia's favor, that is, uh, already the EU and US are talking about sanctioning Georgia because uh, uh, they because they want uh, their elected parliament won't uh, won't uh, will turn around and and uh, and cancel the law which they have, you know, democratic legitimacy to pass. Uh, so we, we we continue to see this, and when when mm-hmm. this happens, I think the the it, this uh, excessive coercion against Georgia is pushing Georgia in the other direction, and I think the the Russians are quite aware that if they interfere to to openly into Georgian society, that this would push them in the in the opposite direction. So, um, and again, this is also a good reason why they want to minimize any interference. Uh, keep in mind that in in Ukraine, even after they took uh, Crimea, the Russians, American polls show that still only twenty percent of Ukrainians wanted to join NATO. So you really need a lot of interference in order to begin to push uh, the country in the opposite direction. But uh, um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, the government wins. Uh, the, the opposition will begin to take to the streets if they turn violent. Then. Uh, yeah, hundred uh, percent likelihood. The, I think Washington will blame the the government for the violence. The overnight, they're not going to be a vi- government anymore. They will be referred to as a regime. Uh, this is a, a yeah. There will there will be headlines about uh, Moscow seizing control effectively over Tbilisi. This was a, 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 a Russian election. Putin won the election in Mo- in Georgia. So the headlines have pretty much already been written to this extent. And uh, right. again, that's us versus them again. That's why, even when we talked about the NGO law, it was democracy versus a Russian law. It's uh, there's um, yeah, the, the, the narratives or the stereotypes have already been formed. There, yeah, you know. Oh, go ahead, Pascal. Yeah, just there's this one interesting aspect now, and I will link these two, uh, these two newspaper articles. One in Politico, the other one in Washington Post, which are kind of really the worst of the worst of uh, trying to create a narrative around Georgia, really the worst, that while saying that nobody tries to influence uh, Georgia, they clearly try to <laughs> influence the way that this um, election is being perceived. But an interesting thing is that they now admit that the accusation is that the the other side, the, the some, not all, but some of the uh, parts of the opposition are kind of a pro-war faction and that the West is a uh, pro-war alliance that would like to push Georgia into the Russian uh, bayonet. And they they represent that as a conspiracy theory. There's a conspiracy theory in Georgia that the evil West wants to uh, do something bad to Georgia. We, the good West, would never do that. The interesting thing is, is that they admit it, because usually admitting that such counter-narratives exist is rather a, a, a sign of strength for the counter-narrative that it needs to be talked about. It cannot just be ignored, because usually the tactic is to just ignore what doesn't fit into the narrative. The second strategy is then to to make that a Russia uh, or a, a pro-Putin uh, uh, aspect. So how do you two, both of you, maybe Glenn first and then uh, Lasha, uh, interpret the fact that this is now being openly discussed as a, as a, as a counter argument towards this, um, towards bringing uh, Georgia into the fold? Glenn, do you want to take that first? Yeah, yeah sure. Now, well, I found that yeah, those articles would be fascinating as well, because the whole topic is uh, America and the Europeans do not interfere in Georgia. But then at the same time, you know, you see this <laughs> throughout the text, this, uh, you know, it's, uh, this could be the end of Georgian democracy. America must do more. Uh, Georgia is now, it can either be a slave to the Russian or join the European family. Um, we, Georgia is about to become a one-party state. Uh, um, Joe Biden and the EU must prevent this from happening. And then 
below well, this conspiracy theory that we would ever interfere it's it's uh yeah it's uh it, it becomes ridiculous but but this is the main assumption that if you intervene over values then it's not really interference at all um just as a bit of a comparison um you know in in ukraine there's a, it's a huge uh, focus on the and the, on the budapest memorandum that uh, which were given to uh, to U- Ukraine, uh, Belarus, and Kazakhstan to give up their nuclear weapons. And in return, no one would interfere in their domestic affairs. No one would use economics to manipulate their politics and undermine their sovereignty. Uh, well, the, the United States, they pushed when they pushed hard sanctions against uh, Belarusians, uh, they, they, this was in breach of this uh, Budapest Memorandum. Of, of course, also toppling the government of Ukraine breaches this as well. Uh, but uh, on the website of the American embassy, they actually point out, well, this is not uh, undermining their sovereignty. We are putting sanctions because of uh, upholding human rights. So it's kind of become an exception. So it's not interference at all anymore. And uh, so I, I see it through the same prism, this uh, idea that we're not trying to interfere, but uh, uh, but we have to save democracy there. And, and every time we want to save democracy, you know, it's it's always a code word for geopolitics. It's always uh, uh, to put um, uh, them in our camp, and the, the the usefulness of Georgia is quite evident in this instance. We would like to create some pain on uh, Russia's, uh, yeah, on, on the Russian South. So it's uh, you know, it's yeah, I'll leave it to Lush. It's just it's it's a typical newspapers you see, and uh, yeah. it's become we've become you know, accustomed to the how hypocritical it is. I guess. Yes, um, we all look behind this, you know, liberal, uh, you know, language. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's this sort of ruthless, in a way, um, real politic, if you if you will, um, you know. But um, this is probably a generalization on my part. But you know, Stephen, uh, I always think of uh, when, when when I think of uh, uh, narratives and propaganda that uh, of which Georgia has become a victim uh, in the past thirty years or so. Um, I always think of um, uh, Stephen Wertheim's book, uh, Tomorrow the World, how United States, uh, sort of this conveyor belt of universities, think tanks and state departments was you know, creating these, these you know, public narratives to bring the U.S. out of isolation. And uh, what a brilliant system they set up um, to really mold the public's opinion. Um so yeah, I can you know on a much smaller scale, uh, perhaps even in a much less important scale, um, I see parallels with that. Um, it, it, the funny thing is, you know, 20, 30 years ago, fifteen years ago, these conversations were not happening in Georgia. Everyone believed uh, these things. That's the irony of it. That's the tragedy of it. Um, and the United States continues to sort of, you know, you know break down the open door, meaning Georgia, you know, this, I cannot emphasize this, you know, often enough, you you don't need to tell Georgians how to dislike Russia, not Russian people per se, but the system uh, that really, you know, victimized Georgia, let's be honest, uh, uh, through invasions and and, and, and conquering Georgia in in, in the, uh, uh, after the Bolshevik revolution and so forth. But, um, Somehow, I think this is just a, a blind um, push for something that even the West, in my opinion, doesn't know what it's doing anymore. It's sort of the abyss where, you know, you ask them, what are you eventually trying to accomplish here? And the question, are you trying to actually promote democracy, which is a foregone conclusion and nobody talks about this anymore? I mean, you know, you know look, Francis Fukuyama's thesis uh, – even in Georgia, they're saying now, who who wants to listen to Frank anymore? Um, you know, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful by any means. I'm just giving facts here. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you know, you know, end of history thesis will 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 fly well in Georgia unless you bring together some you know radicalized faction of the population who still sort of believes in all that. But um, so democracy has been betrayed. Uh, you know, the liberal economy and 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 sort of. Um, truly liberal economy, not neoliberal version of it has been betrayed. Um, you know, and history itself has been betrayed because uh, because uh, what because historically Georgia has always been pro-Western. 
And yet somehow it's been turned into this grotesque version of what the West is telling Georgia is pro-Western, not what Georgians have for 700 to 1,000 years believed is pro-Western, meaning make us part of the West. And they were genuinely trying to do that throughout centuries. Um, but geopolitics, uh, national interests, regional politics, and, and the politics uh, of that era uh, in Europe, for example, um, were just not allowing it to happen. Uh, and so now you reconcoct, sort of you, you know, reestablish this new narrative within this neoliberal, you know, paradigm saying, you know, the history is over, you know, even though, wait a minute, we're still trying to get into the West. You're not telling us every, anything new. What is it that you are saying that we don't know, basically? Uh, but the way it was, it's been packaged to be delivered to the Georgian population has been nothing short of, you know, uh, criminal, really, uh, because what happened is be Georgia just gobbled it all up, it's been packaged, it be it's been politicized, and it's divided the society, and in my opinion, eventually led to the 2008 war. Um, uh, and then when you know that there is no NATO, when you know that there is even, even European Union is in the distant future, if that ever materializes, and obviously NATO is just out of the question, but when you tell them that, you know, NATO is coming any time now, you just continue to, this is not even, this, got, this, is, this is above and beyond any, any, any realistic sort of plan to help a small country become a, a part of, this is basically telling them, go self-destruct, we'll call you heroes, and then as long as you, you know, go and fight against Russia, our common enemy, you will always be in our minds. Um, that's basically what it boils down to, and it's really tragic. We, we have reached the one-hour mark. Glenn, I would like to give you the last word. Anything you want to react to or add to the discussion? No, just uh, I agree with um, how these NGOs are reshaping society, but it's not by accident either. And uh, me and Pascal talked about this before. This, was, uh, also, this fell under the uh, Reagan doctrine when they actually established all these NGOs uh, for the explicit purpose of intervening uh, into the domestic affairs of of uh, other countries and manipulating their civil society, and uh, again they they formed all of this. They're almost hundred percent funded by government. They are often staffed by people linked to the intelligence community. There's been like all these books, articles. There've been uh, whistleblowers from the CIA. You had the. Uh, uh, so, so this is you know documents which have been released. So, so this is very obvious. Everyone knows this, but still, uh, it doesn't impact the narrative, and uh, and and this is problematic. Uh, even one of the at National Endowment for Democracy, one of the co-founders, actually pointed out that yeah, what we do now used to be done by the CIA, and uh, this is uh, how we now do covert operations. We uh, push our we, we try to manipulate civil society, but instead of using CIA and get caught uh, and being embarrassed, we just uh, frame them as uh, human rights organizations. And it's not interference anymore. And uh, it's even moral, uh, morally righteous to do so. So I think uh, we, we, we end up in these situations where uh, we effectively paint ourselves into a corner. There's only one, uh, one, one thing we can do, as, as you said, uh, Lasha, when... Uh, when you ask what do we actually want to achieve in Georgia, I've I've asked the same uh, with 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 Ukraine. Like, uh, should we have done the same thing over again, toppled the government in 2014, given that right. you know it didn't have support by the majority of Ukrainians and the country burned to the ground? It's like yeah, yeah, yes, it was a principle, it was a democracy. But what, yes. why was it democracy if it wasn't supported by the public? If we removed democratically elected government. Uh, and if it led to all this death and destruction, wh where does the democracy fit, in? democracy fit in? And it's always, well, we're pulling Ukraine towards us or Georgia towards us, and we are a democracy, and uh, Russia's the opposite, so uh, everything else disappears into the background. And this is why we end up in this weird situation where we say, well, we're pro-democracy and pro-Ukraine, which is why we toppled the government, you know, back the anti-terrorist operation, killing thousands of their citizens, purged their politics, political system, their media, their culture, their church, uh, language, uh, um, uh, subverted their elections. And yeah, all of this was for democracy. None of it's consistent with democracy. Uh, we wouldn't do that in our own societies. But uh, again, the whole idea right. is if you take the country away from Russia towards us, any means will be justified by the ends. And the ends is that we are a democracy. Russia is not. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's... Um, 
it's 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 a great tragedy. And if if uh, Georgia would have been benefiting from any of this, I might have a different view. But uh, but uh, the way I see it, uh, uh, Georgia loses, and eventually I think uh, uh, the West loses as well. So it's um, yeah, it's yeah. a poor policy. What we need is pragmatism, pragmatism to reach some form of stable arrangement. Uh, gentlemen, colleagues, uh, Glenn Deason and Lasha Kasaratze, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much both. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Lasha. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you. Thank you.